Amen. What I like to do whenever I begin a message is I often like to start with an introduction that somehow sets up the text that we'll be studying for the day. I'm not going to do that today because the text that we're studying really needs no introduction. Instead, what I like to do is just read part of it to you, and I'm going to ask you while I'm reading it to let the Holy Spirit speak it into your life. I'm going to ask you to notice something. I want you to notice the call that it puts on your life. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy, because I am holy. And since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. I would suggest to you that the biggest hurdle, the biggest obstacle that you and I have, not in believing in Jesus, but in being a follower of Jesus and living like Jesus here, is this inward compulsion to fit in. This inward desire, a motivation to belong, to be normal, to be a part of the crowd. What you just heard is God's call in your life to be different. A call in your life to be set apart, to be distinct from the world around you. We need to understand this, church, because the call of the culture around us is to be normal. It's to be normal. Have you ever stopped and asked what normal is? To me, normal is constant tension and anxiety, depression, despair. Normal is constant fear over what the world is coming to, what our politics, what our government is going to do, what the unknown is. That's normal. Normal is when addiction overtakes your life and dictates everything in your world. Normal is broken relationships. Normal is sexual dysfunction. Normal is divorce. That's normal in our world today. And if that's what normal is, I don't know about you, I want nothing to do with normal. I want to be different. This is the call God has put on your life. And Jesus invites you into this when he says, the road is wide that leads to destruction and many people are on it. But narrow is the road that leads to life and only a few people find it. And it is narrow not because God wants not many people on it. It's narrow because most people are satisfied with normal, the wide road. But what they don't know is that the life they're stepping into is a life of destruction and so here's my question for you. Are you a follower of Jesus? For those of you watching online, stop for a moment. Are you a follower of Jesus? And if you are, the job that you have is not to simply enjoy the life that Jesus bought for you on the cross. Your job is to live your life in such a way that the rest of the world who is living normal can see it and say, ah, you know what? There's something about that life that I want. So I'm going to jump ship and walk on that narrow road. Be holy, for I am holy. So Heavenly Father, as we dive into what it means to be holy, what it means to be different, I pray that you will inspire us. No, that's the wrong word. Will you transform us? into the likeness of your son, Jesus, so that as we live in this world, there's a noticeable difference between us and the rest of the world around us so that people can say, you know what? You look a little bit like Jesus. You think like him, you smell like him, you talk like him, and it's appealing. And so may we live lives that are holy in nature so we can be your hands and feet. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, we are here to talk about what it means to be holy. All right. And so welcome to part two of this series through the book of first Peter. We're calling it different. And last week we asked the question, you know, what is, what is so different about being a Christian? Why am I supposed to be different? And we just started that conversation and guys, we got a lot more conversation coming. Uh, but today we're going to talk about, you know, what does it look like for you and I as followers of Jesus to be 
holy. Now, if you are with us right here or if you're watching online and you are not a follower of Jesus, my first thought to you is simply this. We really are glad that you are with us and you do not have to be a follower of Jesus to be a part of this church community. We would love for the day where you make that decision and we're going to encourage you to do that. But we want you to know that this message is as much for you as it is for the rest of us in the room. And so uh, we really are glad that you guys are with us. I do want to be upfront with you very quickly and say that Part of my study for this message this week came from a source that was a message another pastor I admire preached. And so what he said was very pertinent to this message and a lot of valuable thoughts. And so just up front and be honest with you, uh, all of this message is not original to me. And I just want to let you guys know that. Um, but, but here's the question, guys. What does it mean to be holy? When I was younger, we, I grew up on a street and just down the road, uh, the property owned some horses. Uh, three of them actually, and I loved watching those horses. Uh, the, the, the field that they grazed in butted up against the road that we lived on. And there's an opening in the fence. So in order to keep those horses from escaping, right, in case they got rebellious, they had a couple of lines that became an electric fence. You guys have seen these electric fences before. Apparently on this particular day, the friends that I was with was, were bored. And so we're walking up and down the street and we came across this electric fence and they said, you know, it'd be really funny if somebody touched that fence. <laughs> You're laughing not because it's funny, but because it's stupid, right? <laughs> and then they looked at me and said, hey, Eric, you should touch the fence. Now, here's what you need to know about these electric fences. There's enough electricity in that fence that if a horse touches it, it's really not going to do that much damage to a thousand pound animal. It's going to be enough of a pinch, though, to say, stop moving forward, get back in that field, right? Right. It's a different story if a hundred pound kid touches that fence. Now, here's what else you need to know about me. At that time in my life, I really struggled with an insecurity of being accepted. I really wanted to be liked. I really wanted to be a part of the group. And, and to be honest with you, there were some things that I would do, perhaps I'd be willing to do, that might not be the most wise decision or rational decision, but if it made me feel more a part of the group, I might be more willing to do that. So they said, hey, Eric, you should touch that fence. Do you know what it feels like when you touch an electric fence? It was just a moment. That's as long as it took me to touch it. But in that quick moment, all of that electricity coursed through my body. And if I could describe it for you, it was like a sledgehammer hit every part of my body at the same time. And even though it was just a moment, it was an intense amount of pain. You know what happened? They all laughed. I'm so glad I made him laugh. <laughs> and you're like, dude, that was such a dumb move. And I know I completely agree with you. That was a really dumb thing to do. But here's what I've learned about myself in that time. I was smart enough and old enough to recognize that was an irrational and unwise decision to make. But I didn't have enough sense to let that rational decision overwhelm the pressure to conform and be accepted. And so many of us are living right there today. Man, we're smart enough, we're old enough to know what the right decision is, but sometimes the right decision and the rationality of it isn't big enough or strong enough to overwhelm the desire to conform, be accepted. But here's what we hear from Peter. God says, I don't want you to be normal. I don't want you to conform. I didn't create you to do that. I didn't die on the cross for you to be just like everything else around you. I've called you to be different. I've called you to be set apart. I've called you to be holy. Now, let me pause though and make a couple of thoughts. There is a godly reason to be different. And this is what I'm asking us to embrace. But there are also ungodly reasons to be different. And these are reasons I'm asking us to reject. And so when you come into the office and all your coworkers say, you know what, man, we're all putting full-time hours in. But Eric, when he comes in, I don't know if he's even putting part-time hours in. And you say, well, you know what, I'm just trying to be different. No, no, that's not different. You're just lazy. You just don't have a work ethic, right? And when you come into the group and everyone's like, you know, every time you come in, there's this odor that you bring in and you're like, well, you know what? I'm just quirky. I only shower once a week, but you know, I'm just different. No, you're not. You just don't have any social skills. You have any etiquette. You don't have any professionality. So here's the thing. I don't want you to be known for your difference because you lack a quality. God says, I want you to be different because of your holiness. There's a huge difference. Be holy for I am. I am holy. 
Be holy for I am holy. So what does this mean? It means that when all the guys are together at the break, maybe at the water cooler, whatever it is, and they're all berating their wives and laughing at it, you will be different and you will walk away. It's when everybody else wants to be known for the kingdom that they are building for themselves, you will be different. You will be known for the kingdom of God that you are building. When everybody else wants to be known for their vast wealth, you will be different. You will be known for your generosity. When everybody else wants to be known for their political stances, you will be different. You will be known for the gospel. God has called you to be different. Be holy because I am holy. Be holy because I am holy. That's what we are called to do. Because I recognize there's a problem. Here's what I want you guys to know. As your pastor, I want you to know that I genuinely want to live a holy life. I do. I'm not just up here as a preacher talking about the Bible and stuff just because I'm paid to do it. No, no. I'm up here because I genuinely want to live a holy life. But you know what? I recognize something inside of me. I don't know if this is true for you guys, but at least I know it inside of me. There's something inside of me. The best way I can describe it is this. There's something that is bent away from holiness and toward conformity. Is that true in you at all? I mean, do you guys feel this at all? I mean, I really want to live for Jesus, but there's just something in me that compels me toward evil compels me to fit in with the rest of the world. And that thing drives me nuts. In fact, Paul talks about this a little bit. He says, you know what? The things that I want to do to live for Jesus, those are the things I don't end up doing. But the things I don't want to do, like evil, those are the things I end up doing. And then at the end of the passage, he says this, man, what a wretched man I am. Who will save me from this life? And he says, thanks be to Jesus Christ who sets us free. So the reason I say this, guys, is this. Even though I genuinely and honestly want to live a holy life for all the right reasons, it's not natural to me. It's not instinctual. It's not like second nature. I can't just stand there and be like, all right, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. Boom, I'm holy. No, that's not the way it works. This is why Peter says, make sure you don't conform to the evil desires you used to have when you lived in ignorance. Another version, I really like it a lot better. It simply says this, make sure that you don't slip back into your old ways. Why does he say that? Because it's natural for us to slip back into those old ways. Just because you're a follower of Jesus, just because you've been forgiven, does not mean that those desires evaporate. Doesn't mean that evil is no longer viable in your life. It means it's there and it's probably even a stronger pull. So it's not natural to me. So here's what I learned, guys. If I'm going to live a holy life, I have to be intentional. I have to be strategic. Now, for those of you who are followers of Jesus and you've recognized that same bent in you away from holiness, you've also had to learn how to be intentional about this. So you might have some strategies in your home on how to train your family in holiness. There's just some things that Heather and I have done in our home that we think is being strategic. And I just want to share some things with you about this. Let me just talk about this. One of the things that Heather and I do is, is, is we're intentional about reading our Bible. We're intentional about spending time with Jesus. And so we read our Bible we pray, sometimes we journal. And we don't just read the Bible. No, 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 we let the Bible read us. And so before I read my Bible, because it's not like any other book out there, it's the living and breathing word of God. I say, Holy Spirit, open up my eyes to see what you want me to see. Open up my heart to receive the truth that you want to plant in me for the purpose of transforming me into the likeness of Jesus. That's holiness. That's intentional. And here's the thing, like I've said before, I have to do this earlier than I want to wake up to do it. I have to be intentional. Something else that Heather and I are intentional about is we're part of a community life group that meets on Sunday evenings. And we've talked, about our, we've talked with this about our community life group, but every single Sunday evening, we'd rather just stay home and chill. Man, I just preach on Sunday morning and I'm kind of spent, I'm done. During the school year, the kids have school the next day. So really it's a time to just relax the end of the weekend, get ready for school the next day. So it's hard, honestly, to go to our community life group, but we're intentional about it. So every time we do go, we're glad that we did. 
Because in our community life group, there's encouragement. There's teaching. There's mutual support. There's friendship. There's community. And every time we go, we love the people more that we get to do life with. And they have become dearly loved friends and family. It's intentionality, guys. Holiness doesn't just show up. It's intentional. But it didn't stop there. We're intentional with how we're trying to train our kids to be holy. For example, for example, we will not allow anything into our home, whether it's read, watched, or participated in, that celebrates the demonic world or celebrates anything that is sexually immoral. So we will not watch movies that, that highlight and showcase demonic power. We're not going to do that. We're not going to watch TV shows, whether it's HBO or anything else, that highlights and celebrates sexual immorality. For our kids, for example, my daughter, she's a 10-year-old girl, man, she loves to read. And if we let her, she'd be in a room all day, door closed, reading book after book. We don't let her do that because that's not healthy, right? We're like, hey, be with some friends, you know? Anyway, every time she reads a book, we look at it. And now most of the books that she reads right now, I mean, she's 10 years old. These are like these tween girl kind of books. I mean, they sound and look very innocent, right? But there's one book she brought in the house recently, and I read the back cover, and here's, here's kind of the gist of the story. It's a story of a group of tween girlfriends, right? And it's like boy problems, these kind of things that tween girls have, which is just ridiculous. It's like tween version of Hallmark Channel, come on. <laughs> but here's the thing about the book. Um, it was a story that these, all, all these girls were little witches, and whenever they had boy trouble, they, put a cast, they cast a spell on these boys. I'm like, nope, you're not reading that book. We don't let them watch any kind of TV show, even if they're like a Nickelodeon cartoon that has witchcraft or, or goblins or vampires in it. No, we don't let them do that. For like Halloween and stuff, listen, you can have your own philosophy on Halloween. We let our kids dress up in costumes and walk up and down the street asking for candy because let's just be honest, all that candy ends up in my office. <laughs> love it, love it, love it. And so if my kid wants to dress up as a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, man, that's totally fine. If my girls want to dress up as Elsa and Anna, that's great. I'll buy you a costume, but you're not going to dress up as a witch or a goblin or a vampire, or anything like that. And some of you are like, dude, you're so strict. What are you doing? Here's what I believe, guys, and I firmly believe this. One of the strategies of our enemy, check this out, is to take what is spiritually serious and destructive and make it cute, innocent, and casual. And so when I see pictures on Facebook during Halloween of a bunch of little girls dressed up as witches and the caption is, oh, such a cute little group of witches. I'm like, dude, do you know what witchcraft is? I mean, it's diametrically opposed to the gospel and it has roots in the demonic world. What are we doing? And some of you are like, dude, calm down, man. Quit being such a tight parent. And his, listen, I really want to hear your thoughts, guys. And so I want you to do is, is, is send me an email. Here's my email. It's eric at I don't give a rip what you think dot com. <laughs> send me an email, all right? I want to hear everything you say. <laughs> Be holy, for I am holy. Be holy, for I am holy. And this is why Peter says in verse 14, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. And even though it's evil, don't allow it to become trivial, casual, cute, or innocent in your life. Because all of a sudden, that's a doorway, I believe, for the enemy to step and begin to change your theology. Don't do it. But here's what's interesting, guys. He says that you had those evil desires when you lived in ignorance. You know what that word is? It's agnoia. It means moral blindness. What that means is that sometimes when you're living in evil desires and conforming to the world around you, it's not really because you're trying to intentionally be rebellious against God. It's because there's a moral blindness that's in you. This is why I love what Paul says in Romans 12. He says this, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, right? But be transformed. There's the word. Become a new person, a new creation by the renewing of your mind. Then he says, once you have a renewed mind, you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. You'll be able to say, you know what? I see that's what God's will is. And I agree with it. And then he says this. You will see that it's good, 
pleasing and perfect. A renewed mind. So here's my question, guys. Where does holiness start? Where does holiness start? From what I'm understanding from Peter, holiness starts in the mind with a renewed mind. How does that happen? It begins by embracing Jesus as Lord and Savior. And here's the promise. The moment you say yes to Jesus, he says, I will put my Holy Spirit inside of you. He will take up residence in you and begin the transformation process. You want to know what that looks like? Read John 14, 15, 16, and 17. The moment you say yes to Jesus, his Holy Spirit takes up residence in your heart and he begins the transformation process. And all of a sudden, your mind begins to be renewed. You can discern. You can discern between right and wrong, good and evil, wisdom and not wisdom. And there, you begin to look more and more like Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful. Do not conform any longer to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. And that's why he can go on to say this. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. So we just discovered that holiness begins in the mind, right? That is being renewed. Where does holiness end up? Where's it supposed to go? He just said it in what you do. Holiness is not an idea. Holiness is not some church language. It's not just some some Christianese word that we use all the time and throw out there. No, no, no. Holiness is visible. It's noticeable. It's discernible. It's it's action-oriented. Be holy in all that you do. Do And guys, this is really important to know because a lot of us have allowed the enemy or the culture or wherever it has come from to change our theology of holiness, watch this, to a theology of success or happiness. Be successful in everything that you do, for it is written, be successful for I am successful. Be happy in all that you do, for it is written, be happy, for I am happy. It doesn't say that anywhere, but so many of us have adopted a theology of success or happiness. And this is what I learned this week, guys. Those theologies will justify behavior that is otherwise ungodly. Yeah, I know I stabbed that guy in the back. I know I berated him in front of his boss. But you know, at the end of the day, I got the promotion. And doesn't God want me to be happy? Doesn't he want me to be successful? So it's justified. Listen, I know that my divorce with my wife really, really hurt my family, but you know what? I need to do what makes me happy, and I just wasn't happy in that marriage. So it's justified. And listen, I know, I know the Bible says we need to keep the marriage bed pure, and we need to save sexual intimacy for the marriage bed. I know God says that, but you know what? I mean... We, I really, really, really love my girlfriend. And you know what? We love each other so much, we're married to each other in our heart. And so I think we're going to be more happy if we start that right now. And so it's justified. He says, be holy, for I am holy. And the problem is when we have a theology of success or happiness, the first thing that does is that's the way, that's the theology the rest of the world has embraced. You don't have to be a Christian to have a theology of success or happiness. And at that point, watch this, the God you serve is no longer the God of the Bible that has represented the exact representation in Jesus Christ. No, the God that you serve is success and happiness. And so now your goal is to get the things that make you happy and successful. So money, power, entertainment, Sex. Now, if that's true, then what is God there for? God is there to help make those things a reality in your life. And when those are your reality, things like inconvenience, risk, discomfort are now outside the will of God. And we are no longer here to serve God and build his kingdom. He is there to serve us and build our kingdom. Be holy for I am holy. What is holiness? Holiness, it simply means set apart, different from, distinct from the rest of the world around us. 
Here, here's my, my, my question for you. Are you seeing that thing inside of you that is bent away from holiness? Are you seeing it begin to turn toward holiness? Is this happening in your life? Why is this so important, guys? For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers. What is an empty way of life? A theology of success or happiness. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are not in your success, not in your happiness. They are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves, that's holiness. By obeying the truth. What's the truth? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, Love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again. There it is. That's the transformation. Not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all men are like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Your success will one day vanish. Your happiness will one day vanish. The word of the Lord stands forever. You know what he's talking about? He says this, one time you were slaves. You were slaves to your evil desires that you used to have when you lived in ignorance. You didn't even know it, but you were a slave. And then Jesus showed up and he didn't set you free by simply saying, hey, uh, go ahead and free yourself. No, he didn't do that. But by the precious blood of Jesus spilt on the cross for you, he set you free. You know what the problem is, guys? So many of us want to go back. In the Old Testament, when God set Israel free from slavery in Egypt, man, they were slaves for 400 years there. And they started crying out to God. The Bible says that God heard their cries. So he sent Moses into Egypt and he says, let my people go. And finally, after a war of Egypt's gods between the one true God, Pharaoh finally said, get out of my town. And so all of Israel was set free. And now they're walking across the desert to the promised land, modern day Israel today. You know what happened along the way? A whole group of people got tired of the desert. Like, man, all we're eating here is manna. All we're eating here is like, is like a little bit of water. It's hot. It's dry. There's nothing here. I'm bored. You know what they started to say? Let's go back. Let's go back to Egypt. At least there we had three square meals a day and a roof over our head. This, is, this drives me nuts. There's a whole generation who was willing to put themselves back in slavery for the sake of a couple desires. Man, don't lose your promised land. Don't lose your freedom. September 22nd, 1862, put a period on a conflict that had been raging for years and a conflict that claimed thousands of lives. And on that day, September 22nd, 1862, several people wrote their name on a document called the Emancipation Proclamation, declaring that every single person, no matter what the color of your skin was, is now all free. Wow, what a day. The problem is there is a place in Texas called Galveston, Texas. They erected a fence around the whole city. Wouldn't let that news get in. And so every single slave that lived in Galveston, Texas had no clue that they were free for two and a half years until finally the Union Army marched into Texas, marched into Galveston, Texas and said, wait, we got a message for you. We understand you didn't get the memo. So we have some news for you. You've been free for two and a half years. 
And your freedom isn't because a bunch of people signed a document. Your freedom is because a whole army shed blood to give you freedom. And so we're here to tell you some news that you are free. You know, you know what's so tragic about this? There's an entire group of people who were free but didn't know it. So they kept living like slaves. Until somebody showed up and said, actually, I've set you free. Listen to what Jesus says. It is for freedom that I have set you free. And if you are to be free, you will be free indeed. When Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove. And he says this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he has anointed me to proclaim freedom to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind. Hope. That's the message. There's so many of us guys who know that we are free and we're still living like slaves because we keep going back. No, no. Be holy for I am holy. What is holiness? Holiness is being different, distinct from, set apart. Watch this. Not just in your behavior, but in your status. You are free. Be different. Be different. And so I want to give you an invitation. I think there's several of you in here, and I think there's a couple of different people in the room. There's some of you who have never accepted the freedom that Jesus is offering you. And today's the day you're going to accept that freedom. But there's some other people in here. You know you're free. You've already embraced Jesus as Lord and Savior. But man, those evil desires, they're so tempting, aren't they? Man, and we just keep being pulled back into it because we want to conform. We want to fit in. We want to belong. And we set ourselves into the slavery we were set free from. And so I want to pray for you and I want to give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus today. So could I invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes? I want to talk first of all to the people in the room who've never said yes to Jesus. What in the world are you waiting for? You know the, the life that you're living outside of him, as Peter says, is an empty life. It's doing nothing for you. It's not satisfying your soul. It's not giving you hope. And the more of it that you have, you are only more disappointed. You are invited this morning to find peace and hope and satisfaction in Jesus. And if that's you, would you pray this prayer with me? You can pray it quietly if you want to or out loud if you want to. I don't care. Thank you, Jesus, for freedom. Thank you for the cross that broke the power of sin and death and the grave. Thank you for my emancipation proclamation and that in you, I am a new person. The old has gone and the new is coming. So transform my mind that my nature is made more like yours so that I love holiness more than evil. And may the life that I live from here on out draw other people to you. Thank you for the cross I confess all my sins. Please forgive me and make me yours. For the rest of you in the room, maybe you're like, you know what? I am a believer. I'm, I'm already free, but I just keep dipping back into my slavery. Today's the day where you say, Jesus, no more. Change my heart and my mind and bring me into holiness so I can live it out and enjoy that life. So thank you, Heavenly Father, for the, the opportunity to be together as a church family. And I pray that as you have called us to holiness, we will be a people who don't just agree with it. We will be a people who live it out. A people who hear that call and say, I am yours, so make me like you. And as those of us who are walking on the narrow road that leads to life, may we live such lives that people on the wide road that leads to destruction will see and say, I want there. I'm going to be like them. And I pray that our very lives will speak volumes to the people who don't know you yet. Thank you, Father, not just for our spiritual freedom, but for our national freedom. 
Thank you, Father, that we get to enjoy being who you have created us to be. We love you, Jesus, and it's all in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Guys, listen, I know I didn't ask for hands, okay? But I know that there are people watching online and right here in the room who gave the lives of Jesus, and I think that's worth celebrating. Would you celebrate with me? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, guys, I just want to say thank you for being with us. Before you leave, I'm going to ask you to do one quick thing, and that is this. Look around the room. Find somebody you haven't met yet, maybe somebody who's not in your generation. And before you go, would you make it an intentional effort to go and meet that family? Make sure that uh, they get to know you, introduce yourselves, build something of a relationship, and definitely go drink a whole lot of root beer, okay? That is for you, because if you don't drink it, I'm taking it home, all right? And I'm going to get a big old belly, and it's just not going to be good, all right? We love you guys. Happy Father's Day, and we can't wait to see you again next week.